now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Carl, Car Kurt Carlson. Kurt is currently a professor at Northeast University and WPI, where he teaches innovation to students, professors, and companies based on the innovation for impact value creation methodology that he developed with his many partners. Kurt is a pioneer in the development and use of innovation best practices, and he's an evangelist for innovation, education, and economic development. And he shares those best practices with government agencies, businesses, and foundations all over the world. He's a widely sought, off, uh, widely sought out uh, speaker and is considered a thought leader on innovation and global competitiveness. He is a big deal. He advises US governors, prime ministers, economic ministers, education ministers around the world on things like innovation, competitiveness, and educational reform. In 2017, uh, Kurt was selected to be a member of WPI's uh, Hall of Luminaries. And it's important to note that that award has only been given to has been given to only 11 previous uh, individuals in its 150 year history of the university. So he's kind of a big deal. So without further delay, welcome. And we are very happy to have you. Kurt Carlson, I'll turn it to you. Well, thank, thank you for that. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I, I when when people do that, I often have to, I feel like to, I have to remind everybody that everything I've ever done is with great partners. Um, we've heard about that earlier today too. Well, my, my, it's my pleasure to talk to this group about um, my favorite topic, which is developing high value innovations. And um, because of Laura and Derek and many others, um, I've learned to appreciate that. Um, uh, complex adaptive system thinking, systems thinking is at the base of that. It's the basis for all successful value creation methodologies we've seen. I want to talk to you about that. So I'm going to start with a few core value creation concepts. So we're just on the same play page. I'll make the point that uh, CAS systems are not just complicated, they're also complicated, but uh, they have these other ingredients of unpredictability and variability that um, makes them very, very different. And I'm gonna describe what we think of as the three laws of value creation and the, the, how emergent properties, which is one of the, the key themes of this conference come out of, if you, if you stick to the fundamentals, uh, good things happen that are beyond anything you would have imagined. And the, the talk today actually, I think applies to everybody here. Um, solving problems that have matter, uh, that matter to others is the core responsibility of all professionals. And so I think there are a couple of lessons here, I think uh, that are take home messages for everybody here about how I think you can do better at this as well. Um, my history is uh, interesting. I started in big companies, um, RCA, GE. I was running the high definition television program, uh, what would have been the first internet company in the world. Uh, they were giving me tens of millions of dollars to spend every year. I was, uh, <laughs> I was a typical big company guy. Uh, then we were bought by um, SRI um, and, and um, that's a, a an innovation company. I'm in, I'm in California right now. I'm in Silicon Valley. It's right next to Stanford University. And it basically is a very famous place and invented the computer um, uh, mouse and a lot of things you use. Anyway, um, we became part of SRI and my best friend, Norm Ronarski, who's in that picture, came to see me and I asked him whether it was going to be a good thing or not. He said, yes, yeah, people think this is going to be great. And I said, well, Norman, you know, before we spent tens of millions of dollars a year, now I think they expect us to earn tens of millions of dollars a year. And I think that's gonna be different. <laughs> and Norman said the magic words. He said, Kurt, we just have to learn. So that set me on a lifelong journey to understand things like uh, systems theory and others. Um, and when I went to SRI, I became the CEO eventually. Um, it had been failing for 20 years. It was close to bankruptcy. The buildings were falling down and nobody liked each other because when you're failing, um, everything uh, falls apart. And when I left after 16 years, we grew the organization three and a half times. My teams won two Emmys. We formed, uh, we weren't we actually were part of the HDTV uh, winning team. Uh, we, we were creating multi-billion dollar businesses with the same people who'd been family for 20 years just by putting in place some better ways for people to work. Uh, the last thing we did was Siri, which was bought by Steve Jobs. So the same people who were failing before 
Um, we're now succeeding by using principles that we're going to talk about, which you'll recognize if because you're all um, uh, cast funds. Okay, a couple quick definitions. Um, there's invention. Invention is when you create something new, and if you get a patent, that's even better. Um, there are about 5,000 mousetrap patents, but only about a, a dozen of them are used. Most of those are inventions. They're not innovations because nobody wants them. Uh, value creation is the other thing we talk about. That's the process where you work together to, to come up with new solutions. Uh, the goal is to identify an important unmet uh, customer and market need and come up with a solution uh, that addresses that customer need, but also satisfies all the other stakeholders. That's the process of value creation. Innovation is when you deliver that into the marketplace with a sustainable business model. At least it's sustainable for a while. If it stops being sustainable, um, it might just stop being an innovation at that point. Okay, well, um, given what I've done and part of um, SRI and all the things we've done around the world and um, um, we've done a thousand, we've worked with thousands of, uh, <laughs> of serious professionals um, in everywhere, every area you can think of in all kinds of companies. And just, um, we just say this, we've worked with a thousand teams, uh, brilliant teams. That's never, the people are never the problem, by the way, never the problem. It's always the way they're working. And typically in a big company, we find that less than 25% of what they're working on has any value for anybody. And we don't decide that. We just give them a framework for them to decide. You can think of that as systems thinking again. You know, do they have a mental model to even know that? Uh, they generally don't. But after even two days, uh, about 75% uh, of them basically should go away. So what's missing? Well, obviously, they don't have a systematic um, value creation process. Uh, otherwise, they would have gotten rid of them before we showed up. I mean, there's enormous confusion between complex and complicated um, methodologies. Um, I'm sure you all see that all the time. The wrong methods will give you the wrong results. So again, so the kind of uh, value creation, the kind of value creation we're talking about here is a profoundly uncertain activity, always in a dynamic ecosystem. And you're, wigg you're wiggling and waggling all the time to, to work your way through to get to where you want to be. So the kind of the core idea that I learned a long time ago from my buddy Norman is we have to learn, connect, improve, and create fast, faster than the competition if you're in commercial business so you can survive. You have to do those things because the answers are not given to you. And one of the key ideas, of course, is to focus on the critical issues first. Before you start getting lost in the weeds, don't do that. That's a big mistake. We see that everywhere. You want to focus on the core things first and then satisfy them and move on to the next core things. Um, my my um, education in this comes from many different points of view, obviously from uh, complexity analysis. Um, <laughs> we have a, um, uh, that uh, the Cabreras have made a big deal about. I mean, this is a classic example of, there are only three rules here, you know, follow the person in front of the person, the bird in front of you, uh, don't get too close and uh, avoid uh, uh, your prey. Those three rules will basically predict this complex behavior. If you get lost in the details of this, you're just, you're going nowhere. You're not gonna be able to figure it out. A second core concept comes from Doug Engelbart in the idea of uh, compounding knowledge. You don't wanna just add knowledge. That's, that, that, that's not gonna get you where you, you need to go fast enough. You need to actually create processes that compound knowledge so you actually can have exponential improvement in the results. The third thing is, um, uh, this is a learning science, so we want to use the best learning um, uh, in educational science as well. So that's active learning, team science. Uh, here's just uh, some of the principles, repeated doing, real-time feedback, multiple representations, and of course, focus on the big ideas uh, first. So there's a lot of overlap with these three areas. And the last thing I would mention is just uh, behavioral science. Uh, this is a picture of prospect theory. Um, um, value creation is a very subjective personal thing. There's no, you know, we all decide on the value. And so you have to understand the human properties and the kind of uh, prejudices and the uh, biases we have. I um, mean, this one little example just shows that when I give you a dollar, you feel so much good. But if I take a dollar away from you, you're going to feel more than two times worse. Uh, value is also very asymmetric <laughs> in terms of how we perceive them. So these are the, the core um, um, areas we work in. Okay, so here's, here's our three laws of value creation. The first is you need to focus on important 
unmet customer and market needs. Otherwise, you're not going to make an impact. This is directed learning. We're not just trying to learn. We're trying to learn to solve problems. And we need to know how to be able to identify ones that matter. The second one, again, this is what this conference is about, is shared mental models, methods, and tools. Otherwise, you can't collaborate effectively. If, you, if all the mental models are in different spaces and they disagree with each other, you're not going to be able to uh, collaborate effectively. And the last thing is recurring team value creation forms, because you need to synthesize solutions. You need to do that. You need to improve faster than the competition and the alternatives, those three things. And what we've learned doing, you know, again, thousands of workshops around the world with, with professionals is if these are in place in some way, generally the results are pretty good. So there are variations about what I'm gonna say, but if these are basically in place, the, the results are pretty good. It's like the three laws of the flocking birds. If you do these three things in innovation, you'll probably be, you'll be probably ahead of the pack. But if you don't do these three things, I can almost guarantee you the results you get will be episodic. They will not be systematic. Okay. A couple of other quick definitions. What's the definition of customer value? By the way, most teams don't know this. It's customer benefits over customer costs. Again, it's a perceptual thing. It's a ratio. It's not customer benefits minus customer costs. Uh, different people like different things. Some people still like uh, uh, smartphones with keys on them. Most of us don't. Uh, it's up to the end user. So the benefits and costs are perceived by the customer, not by us. It's subjective. Um, What's the definition of a value proposition? We consider this to be the most important idea that it was certainly the most important idea I'm going to give you today. Um, and if you use this, it'll transform the results you get in your company or maybe uh, even beyond that. The, the goal is always when you're trying to solve problems that have meaning for others, you need to address an important unmet customer and market need. That's the need part with a new compelling and defensible approach for the offering and the business model. Again, it's not an innovation if it doesn't have both. And hopefully with superior two to 10 times better benefits per cost, you now recognize as the definition of value when compared to the competition in all other alternatives. And one of our rules is if you can't describe at least these four questions, you still haven't figured out what to do. Now, how is this complexity theory? This is complexity theory because these four questions all interact with each other. If you change one of them, let's say the need, the other three is probably going to change. If new competition comes along, the others are probably going to all change too. You want to start with these four questions. You can't eliminate one of these. If you eliminate one of these, you don't really know what you're doing. So you want to make it as concise, as fundamental as you can, because in the beginning, this isn't in the beginning, these are all going to change as you put your project together and as you move forward. And if you don't, if you can't answer these four questions, you're probably going in the wrong direction and you will probably fail. And that's what we see over and over around the world. Now, here's the biggest mistake we make. People will learn about a problem and then they'll jump to a solution. We call those big A's. You don't wanna do this. <laughs> when you hear a problem, it's generally not the need to be addressed. And if you jump to a solution, it's probably gonna be wrong. It's almost always wrong. It's, and you can just assume it's wrong. You don't want to do this. In almost all of the presentations I say, I listen to thousands of presentations you know, in my career. They almost all, whether in big companies, small companies start, they most all look like this when they start. We don't want to do that. So how do we get out of this trap? We get out of this trap using a family of techniques called reframing. And the reframing starts in the way we run our incubation process. We call them value creation forms because we need to learn and synthesize and create solutions faster than the competition. So what we do is we'll have three to six teams come in and they'll give one to 10 minute NABC value propositions. And we'll do this regularly from one week to four weeks. It's just a regular ongoing activity because you're not going to solve your problems in just one workshop or a, or a meeting. And the presenters will give, let's say, their five-minute value proposition, and then we'll ask them to be quiet. And then we give them feedback. So here's the start of the reframing process. What was good? Don't forget that. I already did a brilliant job on that one. Uh, improve it. Derek, you could have done a better job on this one. So here's some ideas. Eyes of the end user. Would they be interested in this? Eyes of the investor. 
eyes of the staff, you can continue this kind of reframing by these different perspectives, a really core idea of, of caste thinking, okay? So this, this helps enormously. But there's another thing that also helps enormously. In this kind of a format, what you're hearing is these different colors are basically trying to represent, um, there are five different presentations that are being given one after the other, very short, five minutes, just on the fundamentals. Um, and you listen to one after the other. And it's inevitable that somebody will do a good job on something. Like somebody may really get, get the need right. They may quantify it. They may be very specific. They may do a terrific job. Well, everybody else is watching that. And they're all smart people. They want to do a, a good job. So they've learned from that. And maybe somebody does a really good job on the competition. They're specific. They name the competition. They can specify where that competition will be in five years. They become a role model for everybody else. Now, the thing about focusing on the fundamentals is you can do this kind of comparison. In most meetings, it's kind of this mess of different approaches, different formats, different people talk for 20 or 30 or an hour, and you cannot do this. And the truth is, this is one of the best ways we learn. We, we do comparative learning for just about everything we do in life, whether you buy a car or you go to lunch, it hardly matters, or do compare data. And it's a little bit, if you run the workshops like this or the forums like this, it's a little bit like an eye test. You know, you could go to the eye doctor and he could say, Kurt, you need some new glasses, put these glasses on. I go, eh, it's a little better. And then he goes, oh, try these. I said, well, uh, maybe, um, give, uh, maybe a, yeah. uh, give me the first part. Again. Give me the first ones again. That wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to get a good prescription if that's the way an eye doctor works. Rather, he does A, B, A, B, which one is better? And in 10 minutes, he can give you a very good prescription. That kind of, that kind of learning goes on if you run value creation forms this way with a, with focused on the fundamentals of value creation. And remember, answering these four questions is really, really hard. We've never seen any team ever be able to quantitatively and specifically answer just these four questions when they came into one of our workshops. Okay, here's another reframing technique. Some of you may know this. Um, so um, here's an MRI machine and uh, children were coming in and they were crying. So uh, they brainstormed various solutions and they, the solution was to, was to sedate the kids. <laughs> They're actually drugging the kids to quiet them down. Now, some of you are laughing. If this is your child and you're the mother, are you happy with this? I don't think you're happy with this. <laughs> it's kind of a, it's focusing more on the MRI machine than the child, right? So the reframing here is to engage them. Instead of trying to focus on the MRI, focus on the children, reframe it toward them. And GE did that. And they came up with this uh, beautifully designed little uh, MRI machine. And the idea is they're trying to make it look like a rocket. And so when the children come in, they say, oh, you're going to have fun. You're going to go on a rocket trip to Mars. And when the engines come in, that, that loud noise, that's when you're taking off. That's where you're going. Now, is, does this solve all of the problem? No. But it solves an enormous amount of the problem without having to sedate the, the children. And who, who, who gains value from this? Does the child? Yeah. How about the parents? Yes. How about the nurses, the doctors, the interns? How about the hospital? You know, if a child is screaming for an hour or two to settle them down, obviously that's a big deal to everybody involved. So here's a simple solution, you know, a couple thousand dollar paint job and all of a sudden you're making millions of dollars for the hospital and you're making your customers a lot happier. Here's another way we reframe. We, we, this is the way they typically sound when in our workshops, people can, um, we're gonna kind of pick on the iPhone here. Uh, so there's a, always a situation, unlimited applications on mobile devices, that's what was going on. There was an exponential increase in applications. What was the problem? Those little keys were um, slow and inconvenient. If you had big fingers, they were really hard to use. That was the problem. So why not solve? Well, Nokia said, let's just add some more keys. So that, that was their solution. Well, in a way, it is a kind of solution. But at some point, the bulk of the phone makes it even less uh, convenient than the original um, phone. So obviously that wasn't a very good solution. So what was the key insight into the solution? The key insight was there's an infinite number of keys there that we need. So we need a display that can actually show an infinite number of keys. That was the only thing. And of course, Steve Jobs did that. Then they said, well, that means it has to be a, a small computer. 
I mean, he added the multi-touch, you know, the way you can scroll around with your fingers uh, to make it even a, a, a more impressive uh, functional phone. Now, the point I want to make here is that, and this is, again, this goes back to Kaz thinking, is that typically we find there's only one or two key insights that define the, the need. It's not a dozen things. People always come in with a dozen things. It's usually only one or two things. In this case, it's only one thing. We need to represent an infinite number of keys. And typically there's only one or two things that define the solution. Now there's a hundred thousand things, you know, before you're, you're done 10 years later with some of these things. But typically if you get these key insights wrong, you're going in the wrong direction and you will not be successful. So again, this is basic uh, uh, complexity analysis or systems thinking. People often ask me, you know, what, what makes Musk so special? Well, I, I don't know what makes him so special, but um, what it seems like he does is he thinks very fundamentally this way. For example, um, I mean, it doesn't take too much for you to realize that space science and, and space communication is a trillion dollar opportunity, right? Okay, that's obvious. Um, so what's holding it up? Well, you can brainstorm in 10 minutes uh, various things that are holding it up and you say, well, you know, it's too expensive. Why is it too expensive? Because when we shoot the rockets up, we blow them up. It's like an airline business where every, after every flight, you blow up the plane. How successful could that be? Okay, we need to, we need to land, we need to reuse the rockets. Okay, that's the need. We need to, we need to, we need to reuse the, the rockets. Uh, then the question was, and this is a little more complicated. He had to prove that in fact, the technology, the navigation, the feedback, the sensing technology, those kind of things, were adequate to allow you to land uh, a structure that's as big as a, a small building on its tail. Those two things, if you prove those two things, you're off to the races. If you can't prove those two things, it makes no sense to do this. And very few teams think this way, very few teams. Here's another mistake people make. Right now there's a, an avalanche of um, methodologies based on minimum viable products. I'm sure you've all heard about minimum viable products. Uh, we actually don't believe that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a good idea, but it has to be used properly. So as I said, most people do big A's. They wanna go and build their idea. As soon as they get their ideas, they wanna build it. And the minimum viable product, which, by the way, which is not a good product by, by definition, they wanna build their minimum viable product almost immediately. It's usually the wrong thing and it devastates staff when they get canceled. You know, you got 30 or 40 people and all of a sudden they've been working for five years building this thing. And all of a sudden you discover that some part of it doesn't make any sense. It's devastating. We believe in doing minimum viable experiments. Again, when you're doing the analysis, think about the things that are the most critical and, and, and see if you can mitigate them before you start building things. So as soon as you start building things, you've gone into this, again, you're lost in the forest in terms of what needs to be done. So here's what we typically see. Most companies, they, 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 they get into this urge to build fast before they've mitigated all the risks and eventually it caches them crashes and burns. And they can spend tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. At RCA, we did this all the time. This was the, this was the major failure mode at RCA when I worked there. The alternative is to mitigate risk fast. You don't spend a lot of money. And once you've figured it out and you prove it, then you go for it and you make it happen. This is what we did at SRI. That's why we were creating multi-billion dollar businesses with no money, because we weren't spending money until we actually serious money until we de-risked the ventures and then went for them and got other funding to help us to build the final product. I believe in most companies, just this one thought would increase their research budget by almost two times, by just eliminating waste. If they just did, if they thought this way, minimum viable experiments before minimum viable products. One idea. Okay, so, uh, the whole story here is you want to start with the fundamentals. I've argued that um, NABC value propositions are absolutely fundamental. You ought, to, you ought to prove that to yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Everything you do when you're problem solving, you're going to answer at least these four questions. Then, as I've indicated, we teach our folks other things, other core ideas. I mentioned key insights and risk reduction, but there's a bunch of things we do. And we do that before we go and then finally build the product and put together a business plan and, and put all the pieces together. That's the way we do it. 
And the, what it means is you, you just profoundly increase the probability of success and leverage your resources enormously, not a little bit, a whole lot. Okay, um, so how do these things evolve? Well, when you start, you don't know very much. People we, tend, we see tend to focus on what they think of as interesting problems. For example, there are 400 drone companies right now. You can make a drone, it's really easy to make a drone. How many of them are gonna survive 15 years from now? Almost none. We see this everywhere. Now you could look for important unmet opportunities, right? That they're everywhere. You could do that. A lot of people are afraid to do that because they don't know how they don't have a good way to go after them. So that's what we preferred to do. We start. We wouldn't know much. We pick a target in some area we thought was eventually going to be really important. But the thing we did which made it possible is we had this very um, intense value creation process and we would zig and we'd zag. And what we learned was that we, if we did the right things, we almost always ended up in a good place. Never where we thought we started because we didn't know enough, but we always ended up in a good place because there are so many possibilities here. So consider Siri. Siri is a personal assistant. How many applications require a computer personal assistant? Hundreds thousands. We happened to hit one, but then we've been doing other ones ever since. So this is how we um, were able to create all those uh, billion dollar businesses. So Syria was like this. We did research for a long time. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of money on this. We did not build a minimum viable product we, until we took the risk out of it. Only when we took the risk out of it did we launch it. Uh, the guy on the right hand side here is Adam Shire. He was the genius who solved the big the key insight to the solution, uh, which uh, is too much for today. And two, day, two weeks after we launched the product, uh, Steve Jobs called us up and came over personally, interesting, uh, to buy the company. So we, we, we didn't want to sell it to him, but he eventually made us an offer we couldn't uh, refuse. And all this time, the team is presenting NABC value propositions, very short presentations, trying to address all of the fundamental issues. And it never stops because even when the, we, are, we are building the product, we're still solving problems and they have to be the best solutions for that particular part. And even when the venture was formed, it never stops. Every professional in the company should be doing things the most efficiently and most effectively that's possible. Okay, here's the, here's the last, there was a great talk uh, to go about uh, what, what's the magic here? Here's the magic. Imagine you're in a company and they're learning these concepts, not much more than I've said. So you, uh, these color boxes are different functions in the company. And uh, the, v, the VCF language means value creation forms, that, that meeting where we get together and people give short presentations using NABC frameworks. If everybody understands those core ideas, you can collaborate from one to another. If, if, value, if, the, the, if the, the, the unit here uh, called one um, didn't have shared language with number two, it would, it would step in here and it'd be almost impossible for it to collaborate. Without shared language and concepts across your enterprise, it's basically a tower of Babel. And that's what we see in almost every company we go into, it's a tower of Babel. There was not shared language and concepts. The mental models that um, the Cabreras talk about are missing. Um, so this makes the organization transparent. You can, you can form teams more easily and the entire structure is profoundly more productive. And of course, you're not limited to your inside. You can actually do this with your partners as well, which is what we did at SRI. We would engage in the same kind of mental model building with them to understand what they needed and come up with solutions that were the most compelling. So in conclusion, I, I tried to uh, frame this in terms um, you folks are all familiar with. The three rules that we have, the three laws of uh, value creation, uh, which enable a value creation community are important unmet customer market needs, otherwise you're wasting your time. You gotta have shared mental models, methods and tools for effective collaboration, or it's not possible. And you can just walk into any company and ask them just for the definition of innovation and you'll be amazed. They don't know it. They don't even know that. Never mind a value proposition. They don't know. They've never thought about it. And the last one is somehow 
if you're going to solve interdisciplinary projects, you've got to get people together to synthesize the solution and tap into the genius of your colleagues. Um, if you don't do that, you're not going to solve the world's big important problems. And the beauty of that is if you take it seriously, it creates an enterprise where you can do the kind of networking, which is also part of CAS thinking, to be able to leverage the full genius of your team. And with that, uh, there's a lot of background information for me. If you want it, there's a free version of this on Coursera, uh, which by, has very high ratings, by the way, <laughs> I'll point out. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn. I write about this all the time. And with that, I thank you. Okay. That was great, Kurt. Thank you. Um, can we see? Can we see Kurt? Okay, good. All right. Um, so we have a, a Q and A period here. Um, great talk. I'm I'm curious. There was one thing that um, that I that I'm not sure I totally understood, but it's it's. Um, the slide where you had all the NABCs across and it yeah. was compounding. Yes. Can you give an example of like a, a, a an example of what that looks like in practice? Well, they're, they're short enough so you can hold them in your mind. You, you, I just listened to your pitch, um, Derek, and because I'm familiar, I, the men, I have the mental model of NABC of a value proposition. So I I now share that mental model with you. So I'm looking. As you give your presentation, I'm looking for those ingredients. And I know if you're not gonna answer those questions, you still haven't figured out what to do. So we're all in the room together. We all share that mental model. And we're all looking to see if people, you know, accurately, specifically, and quantitatively answer those, those questions. And the fact that there are five of them in the room allows comparative, it's a, it's a yeah. system. It's a system from your point of view, but it's also a set of perspectives. So we're actually trying to instantiate the things that you write about all the time in that forum and not violate that. Most, most incubation processes just don't do work because they violate all the fundamental stuff that you and Laura teach. And, and so that, that, that process of compounding is, is kind of the mirror image of what's happening in your enterprise where you're connecting all those groups because they're all sharing that same... They all share that. They all share that mental model and a few others. By the way, it's not. It's not like you need to understand. You know, twenty mental models to be no, effective. Just... It's only three or four things that we taught at SRI, and that was enough. It was never perfect, as we we've, we've talked about today. It was never perfect, but that was enough to transform the place and allowed a little company. Well, we weren't that little. We were twenty five hundred people. But why is it that we, with no resources, because it was bankrupt, remember when I went there, we could beat IBM by seven years with Siri? That's nuts, right? That's yeah. nuts. And the reason is we were leveraging the genius of our teams and they didn't have shared mental models. They did not have a shared incubation process. And the result was we could, they had, they, they, eventually they got there because they could just muscle it, right? We got there by outthinking them basically using, the stuff you guys talk about. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from the audience. I'm, I'm hoping that this will make sense to you. I'd like clarification on what Dr. Carlson said. Not one company knew beforehand. It was in the value creation forum section. Do you know what he's referring to? I really don't. <laughs> I don't either. Okay. Maybe he'll write something else. Um, okay. Could you go from strategy and values to common mental models? Well, they all should fit together, right? I mean, not you, you folks wrote two books about that. There has to be an integration of those or else they're in conflict with each other. So if the mental models don't line up, then it doesn't work. So, so absolutely, they have to. They ha you want to be efficient. And the thing, the thing that's amazing is, think of this company where there was, there was uh, discord and bankruptcy, close to bankruptcy. And we only did these few things with no resources. And we transformed the place and we were then creating multi-billion dollar businesses. Huh. I mean, if there ever was a demonstration of what you and Laura, you know, advocate, we, we were a pretty good example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, another, another question. Do teams come with an idea already somewhat researched or can it be made 
at the forum. Same question with teams. Are they formed prior or at the forum? How is collective wisdom captured at the forum? Well, we, we obviously we did all of those, but the, the way the forums work the best is when people have a pretty good idea and they have a team, you want to, you want a team with generally at least three people on it, because again, you want the reframing to happen in the team as well. Uh, so we do a thing called pitching practice. You want to give it back and forth to each other, back and forth, back and forth, and taking a different perspective. Again, it's what you guys write about. Take a different perspective each time. So this time I'm going to be an investor. This time I'm going to be the end user. This time I'm going to be an employee. We're going to try and recruit back and forth, back and forth. So yeah, so having a small team is uh, really important with, with diverse skills. We, by the way, we do a whole thing on team formation because most teams are violate you know, the core human <laughs> uh, values as well. So that's, but that's a side thing for today. Okay. Um, this one is, do you distinguish between innovation and disruptive innovation? Well, yeah. So, so innovation is on a continuum of incremental and everybody, I hope everybody here is at least doing incremental all the time because that's your, that's your main job. Every time you make a decision about something, um, you basically want to do it in a way that adds a new value to your organization and your team. But yeah, we, we were actually going after um, it was very simple. In our case, we we realized that if we weren't doing big things, we weren't going to get any value from it. We couldn't do million dollar things. We had to do our, our criteria was a hundred million dollar opportunity, and which sounded kind of crazy when we started. Remember, we're failing for twenty years, and all of a sudden, this guy comes along and says, "We can we can actually I do by working this way." By the way, I, I developed a lot of this before I went before I became um, a CEO. So that's so I, I actually showed up. Um, I didn't know it in the, the framework that you folks do, Derek, but I knew enough about these fundamental principles through trial and error that they could be transformative if we could get people to do them. And by the way, I'll tell you one other thing. The reason I teach now is they're life transforming. The kind of stuff that you, this is not a little thing. This is life transforming. You can, if you can master these skills, you can work as long as you want to work. You'll attract the best people. You'll attract money. It's, it's life transforming. <laughs> So, so it's not a little thing. <laughs> okay. All right. So for uh, for service industries such as universities, it is difficult yep. to keep track of the needs of customers okay. and and improve faster than the competition in the market. Your suggestions to thrive in this situation. Oh, boy. Uh, well, universities are tough places because, um, as uh, Derek would tell you, they have to unlearn a lot before they can move forward. So the unlearning part in the university is a real bear. That's a really hard thing. They're, people have spent their whole career uh, learning the wrong stuff. And then you're asking them to behave this way where they stand up, the professor stands up and learns from other people and takes uh, feedback and that kind of stuff. That's not the typical mindset of, uh, I mean, I, I, this is interesting. We hired you know, hundreds of PhDs from Stanford, Caltech, Berkeley, you know, the best schools in the world. None of them came to us knowing how to do this, not a single one. Right. They all had to be educated. And it took us um, three to five years to actually get people to understand this stuff in a, in, a, in a serious way. Everybody can understand this pretty quickly, some of it. But to really you know, be a, a world-class innovator is like a five-year journey of working really hard. Um, so, so, by the way, what, what, just I should mention this. So at WPI, uh, Worcester Polytech, where I teach, which invented uh, project-based learning 50 years ago, we just, the administration just agreed strategically that WPI will be the first university in the world that will graduate every student with a certificate in value creation and innovation. Imagine that. Wow. It took it took me, by the way. It's I won't I won't even tell you how long it took me to do this, <laughs> but it had to be all bottom up. It had to be by getting a cohort of professors, so getting several dozen professors who understood this. One is man to man combat, right? To, to get them on <laughs> to get them on board. But once people got into it, they realized all we're trying to do is help them be more successful, win their grants faster, you know, win better grants, bigger grants. Work with better professors. What, what's not to like about this? But you have, again, it's it's the unlearning and the reframing to get into this new mindset that, you know, if you just work in a slightly product, um, better way, it really makes a huge difference. 
it's hard to convince people of that until they've experienced it though. But that's a big achievement getting getting that at WPI. It uh, yeah, <laughs> I feel pretty good about that one. <laughs> uh, this one is: Do the unmet needs in quotes always need to be confirmed by customer data? For example, didn't Steve Jobs conceive of many of his products without a massive number of customers asking for them? Yeah, so, um, so there are known needs and there are unknown needs. So um, people know they want convenience. That's a known need. That's a known need. Um, you couldn't exactly walk up to somebody and say, would you like a touch screen, you know, with a, with, uh, it's like, what are you talking about? What does it look like? I have no idea. Um, so they couldn't ask for that. But Steve profoundly understood the value of convenience, ease of use, design. These are all dimensions of value that people appreciate. Uh, Marita-san from uh, Japan, from Sony, at the, at the turn of um, the 1950s was that was the original Steve Jobs. He understood this with the iPhone, uh, with the um, I uh, what was it called the the, the first um, portable um, radio. Um, he understood convenience, and most people don't think about that dimension. Steve Jobs was maniacal about that. So, yeah, you ought to talk to your customers. You should always talk to your customers. But what you also want to do is is find out those fundamental underlying needs that people have. You know, I, I gave the example of the MRI machine. Um, I'm not sure you could walk in and, and ask any parent, um, you know, what's your solution to this? Would they say, I make a rocket ship? I don't know. Um, I, I'm sure the guy did talk to a lot of people, and maybe that's how he came up with the idea, but it's, not, it's often not obvious. You have to watch them, talk to them, talk to partners, reframe, 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 reframe. Um, this this thing, that, that Emmy behind my shoulder, that's for high definition television. I had a partner, we must have reframed that thing a thousand times before we came up with a solution. It's not easy, it's not easy. And that's why you need to use all the, the techniques that, that Derek and Laura talk about. Yeah, that, um, the, the, the MRI example you gave, that was Doug Dietz at GE. Yep, yep. And he, uh, he did a bunch with us on DSRP. Oh, there you go. And what he what he talks about actually is the way he came upon that was he went to go see this amazing engineering marvel that they he and the team had created, and then uh, they asked him to step aside and wait in the hallway while a little girl came in to do the procedure, and the little girl was in tears, go. and it just absolutely cratered him because he was like, we just invented this amazing machine that makes little girls cry. I know he actually tears up when he tells that story. He does. He does. Uh, he he and he, and so he went and he started doing you know um, uh, mock-ups with and interviewing children and interviewing psychologists and child developmentalists and all kinds of people, and uh, you know built a story around it, which is yep. which, like you said, was so innovative and. Well, if, if we had more time, I have, I have a dozen examples like that just to reframe. And what you discover is, again, people jump to the solution. It's almost always wrong because they jump to the problem. They don't jump to the customer, the right. reframing with the customer, right? And it's, it's amazing how often you discover that when you reframe it properly, the solution becomes so much easier and provides so much more value. Whereas the first jump was actually a really complicated, hard one. <laughs> Yeah, um, but that's the, that's the hardest thing we teach is how do you focus on what we call the key insights? What's the real unmet need here? Not the problem. The problem says something's going on, but we don't understand it. The, the, the crying child, your example is perfect. It's a terrible situation. Right. But it doesn't it doesn't tell you what what the actual need is. And the actual need is this this uh, young child who basically needs to be convinced that it's a different kind of journey. Right. And had you interviewed that family 30 minutes before that, that would not have come up in the interview. No. Right? No. So um, I, I have one, uh, I guess, one final question, uh, and then we'll have to move on, unfortunately. Uh, the, do you have any insights? One, one of the things that we, we um, get asked a lot, because, because that 
that value is a perspectival thing. Right. Um, and, and humans can, A, we're not great at taking perspective, but when we do take perspective, we often take it from our own perspective. Yes. Any insights or practices or methods or tools or techniques that you've seen to help people get out of taking their perspective of the customer's perspective and actually get into almost empathically the customer's perspective? Well, I think we've mentioned, you know, we, we obviously we reframe multiple times in the yep. value creation forums. We use comparative learning. We have a family of tools to, you know, the we do the, the, the that uh, the MRI example I gave is usually the elevator uh, problem, the way that's presented. Uh, reframing it that way helps some people to prove that a problem is not a need. Uh, yep. Then we have that the other the five what's for the way people actually think about the problem and how they solution. So we we basically use everything we can because that is the problem, Derek. That is the problem. We're all stuck in our own cul-de-sac. Yep. And we need we need our buddies and those to, to amplify those perspectives and finally get us out of the ditch so we can actually solve a problem. I want to by the way I just want our, our close here. So, you know, we've talked about how the business model canvas has become a really popular thing for people to do. I don't know what people in the audience here who use the business model canvas. Uh, that's, that's a tool for complicated problems, not complex ones. Yes, absolutely. Check, checklists are for, you know, it's like you're going to build a new bridge. And so you got a long list of things you got to do and you're checking off the list and blah, 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 but you're going to build the bridge. That's not what we're doing here. And what we've seen over and over again is people who've been marinated in that mental model come yeah. in and are actually going backwards. They have not gone forward, they've gone backwards. So it's not wrong to use that checklist. It's just the question of how are you using it? Do not use that as a value creation tool. It is not, it is anti-CAS. <laughs> it's not the right, right thing to do. So that's another battle is getting people to understand the distinction between complicated and complex so they make sure they use the right tools. That is so true. There's a great book on checklists and, and their use like in flights and with pilots and stuff. But yes. what they fail to communicate is that those are all complicated systems that are very predictable in their behavior. Yep. And they're not complex systems that are relatively unpredictable and diverse in their behavior. So the, unfor uh, the, un the unfortunate thing is there are almost all the real problems in the world that are complex. <laughs> That is absolutely true. All you have to do is add a human and it starts to get complex no. or add a few okay. humans. Okay. Um, I think we, we can do one more okay. question maybe. Um, let's see. Do you think, I haven't even read this one, so hopefully it doesn't say. <laughs> do you think CEOs are learning these ideas? CTOs, where are we at? Also, how could these ideas help make us quicker change on the climate crisis? Yes. Or how would you apply these ideas to more innovative government? Yes. So, um, so we're at T equals zero, as far as I can tell, because, you know, again, we've done this with hundreds of leading companies around the world. And, and so far, we haven't found one who thinks uh, this way or the way Derek and Laura, um, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're out there. I'm sure they're out there. But um, basically, it's a null set. It's the exception that proves the rule. Um, it's not taught in business schools. Uh, business schools don't teach people how to be value creators. I mentioned we've hired, you know, straight A PhDs from Harvard, MIT, Caltech, and Stanford, Berkeley. None of them came to us understanding how to do this. So uh, those are the places you expect this to come from, and it still isn't true. Um, I think of this as a little bit like what happened with total quality management in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, where Japan was kind of desperate uh, to uh, shed the, the image of shoddy products. And they pioneered TQM and they basically took over the manufacturing at that point for a long time. They're in trouble again, but they did for a long time. Um, you know, you can think of Ford as cost, Deming as quality. And now what we're trying to do is get the people to focus on value, creating value, um, solving the big and pro important problems of the world. And I would say we're at equal zero at that because we just, I just never see it when we go into a company. We just never see it. And the problem is until the CEOs are being taught this. So there's a difference between a guy like Musk or, or, or Jobs who, who learn these skills by being entrepreneurs. So when, they, when Steve Jobs came back, it wasn't like hiring a manager. You were hiring an entrepreneur, a proven entrepreneur who was an innovator 
And they're different people and people confuse the difference between a manager. A manager wants to keep the status quo nice and steady. You know, we're, you know, that, that we're just gonna come out every time perfect. Um, but um, people like Steve Jobs or Musk, they're value creators. They wanna, they wanna do new things all the time. That's a special skill. And that category of people is basically not being taught today in a systematic way. Uh, one last thing about that. Um, there's a big push on entrepreneurial programs. Uh, we, we discovered that most of those don't know what they're doing either in terms of value creation, because what they've done is they made the mistake. This is a typical CAS kind of mistake. They jump from you know, nothing to I'm going to fill out 15 charts <laughs> and have my value pitch for my VC. Right. But there's, but there's no value. <laughs> That's right. You, know, you, you, you skipped over the, the seven years of work. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding the system. So it actually, actually, in a way, they get in the way. Of, they get in the way of our work. Um, the only thing that those programs do, there are good programs, by the way. The D School at Stanford is excellent. The BioLex program at Stanford is excellent. There are excellent programs around the world. They're just minority programs. So I have so a, one more question that I actually really want answered because it, it's it's. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily in the uh, for-profit business space. So this person yes, is yes. asking, um, is there is this transferable to the public sector in terms yes. of service provision where no competition exists? Oops. Could the C stand for community legitimacy instead? So the answer to that is absolutely yes, because um, um, we do a lot of work with um, people who want to do the social good, of course, uh, but they have the same issue. They have to come up with a compelling value proposition for their end users. And it has to have a sustainability model. There's nothing worse than spending 20 years on something that doesn't go anywhere. Right. And what, what we find is that those people don't have these skills. And it's very frustrating to them that they don't have these skills. Um, so, for example, at the University of Michigan right now, Michigan wants is uh, working with them because they want to become one of the world's leaders in interdisciplinary research. And again, if you violate those three laws I told you about, you're not going to be the leader in interdisciplinary right. research. Um, so we're working on what they call wicked problems. These are ones that are not just economic. These are ones that are societal as well. And with great success, by the way, uh, we're going to do another one tomorrow. Um, uh, great success. Uh, these, these are people who are passionate, but they lack the skills to be successful. And if they had these skills, it would make a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And you're always sort of, uh, you're competing for something. You're competing for attention or competing for, you know, eyeballs or votes or, so, you know, you're always competing for something. Well, you are. So I have a good friend who's, who's working on um, telehealth in uh, Nigeria. And he happens to be a guy who understands that you need multiple value propositions because there's, it, it's not just one stakeholder. You don't come up with a solution. You got to come up with a value proposition for the people, for the local chief, for the local, you know, whatever mucky muck. Uh, for the government, and and he's not put off by that. He knows how to do that uh, efficiently, effectively, and so he's doing a really enormous social good by bringing healthcare to these people. But he also knows how to do it. All so right, thank you, Kurt. I, we, we've run over a little bit of time. I'm sorry, but, uh, but I wanted to get some of those okay. questions thank, answered. Thank, thank you, Derek. Thank we you really appreciate you being here today, and uh, thanks yep. for a great talk.